Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to uh, just tell you a little bit about Quizify as we begin our webinar. And uh, Quizify is all about solving the problem of poor health literacy. And that is employees not understanding their benefits, not, under, not appreciating their benefits, inevitably spending too much money in the medical marketplace and getting pulled into uh, often unnecessary, uh, potentially harmful, inappropriate medical tests and procedures that are part of our medical marketplace. And, and the way we go about this is on the screen in front of you, uh, two parts. The first part are, is an engaging quiz format where we use trivia and humor to engage employees uh, with the content. Uh, we also have Harvard doctors review our medical content, so that puts validity on the answers. The other part of um, our health literacy services to improve health literacy is an application that you can download from the App Store. Um, there's two parts of it. One part of it is where we teach employees a process to use when they go to the ER so they, they do not get stuck with a large bill that can be somewhat devastating to some families to get a $15,000 ER bill. And we have a process to eliminate that. Secondly, we have um, a service that's point of service um, that has 165 categories of doctor visits. And one is actually colon cancer screening, which we're gonna talk more about today. But this solves the problem of walking out of the doctor's office and saying, oh my goodness, I should have asked that question. Um, so if you'd like, you can go to the App Store after the webinar and take a look at that. Now, a little bit more about our engaging quiz format. We offer these quizzes monthly, 10 questions, takes about 10 minutes to do. 92% of the people that play our quizzes will spend the time, the 10 minutes to complete the quiz. And we try to include as much actionable health literacy, uh, things that when people learn, they can apply it to their lives immediately, be healthier and spend less money in the medical marketplace. We're serving this up in digestible increments. Uh, about a fifth of our 1800 questions are benefits related and customizing these questions is one of our specialties to, uh, to really help your employees understand some of the nuances of your plan that could be most helpful. And we have lots of insights. And one nice thing about health literacy is that 85% of the working age population is health illiterate. So everybody can learn something uh, from get, going up the curve and becoming more health illiterate. Health literate. Now, uh, Al Lewis is going to lead our conversation today. As you all know, Al has written books on population health and wellness, and he spent a lot of time studying the, the new uh, data on uh, colon cancer screening. So without further ado, here's Al Lewis. Thank you, Mark. And uh, apologies to those who we told this would be a half hour webinar. Uh, we got a lot of registration, which means a lot of questions. And there turns out to be considerably more material on this topic that, uh, than we had originally thought, all in different places, and we put it all together. So the first thing we're going to cover is the difference between a screen and a test. Now, that's critical for this uh, webinar because the distinction is very bright line. Uh, some people will say, well, you know, I really need to get colon uh, colonoscopy because if I hadn't gotten it, I had blood in my stool. And if I hadn't gotten the colonoscopy, it, it, you know, I, I would have had cancer. I, I, it saved my life. That's a test. You had a symptom. You had a reason. A screen is done for no reason other than playing the odds. A screen is done for detection, not diagnosis. A test is done to inform a diagnosis. The doctor makes or NP makes the diagnosis on the basis of tests. So detection versus diagnosis is huge. Then there are two other distinctions that are very specifically important in, um, in colon cancer screening. One is that screens are usually simpler. They're usually a, a blood draw or um, something, you know, the blood pressure or something like that. Uh, and tests are usually more complex or hazardous. Colonoscopies are an exception to that, and that becomes important down the road. Screens are quote unquote free. The employee, they're free of the employer, they're not free of the employer. And in the case of colonoscopies, they're quite expensive. A test, unless you are in a zero copay plan, has copay or coinsurance involved and is done in a doctor's office. Screens are never done in a doctor's office. This webinar is about screens for people with no reason to be screened other than their demographics. Now, let's just uh, dispel one myth. 
um, you can screen according to every guideline that there is, and it will not prevent you from getting serious cancer. It, the myth is that it will. It will reduce your odds. But here are some facts. Cancers can be missed. Red flags can create these false positives that lead to an hazardous invasive tests and a lot more stress and cost. And finding a cancer early makes it more treatable in many, but not all cases, certainly does not guarantee a cure. Most importantly, in the case of uh, colon uh, screening, the fastest, and it's true for any screen, but the fastest growing, most aggressive cancers can arise between screens. They can go from zero to you know, a, a stage two, three, or four in a matter of uh, years a few years rather than the slow growing ones that will get picked up on more screens. So before we get into colon cancer, let's look at how well screening works by disease category. And by the way, I think Mark mentioned this and I'm, I'm seeing a couple come in here, but uh, put questions in the Q&A box. Uh, the chat box is not mount monitored as well. So let's start by looking at workplace biometric screens and then get into some cancer screens. The classic workplace biometric screen um, is for diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension, asthma, uh, COPD. This particular chart is admissions for those items, which we call wellness-sensitive medical events, as a percent of total admissions for the employer-insured population. The employer-insured population, the whole country, over this period, and the, 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 every one of these slides is linked, by the way, so we're not gonna go through all the sources, but when we send you the slides, if you want, you can on your own. So this stated approximately 7%, went down a little and up a little, but approximately 7% over this whole period. Now, what you, this particular period also corresponded with dramatic growth in the employee screening industry from less than a billion dollars to more than $7 billion. If in fact the screening was accomplishing its goal of risk reduction, that green line would be falling. Now, if you were to ask people in the wellness industry, and this actually did come up, I had a debate with some folks, a public debate in the wellness industry, with people in the wellness industry, they said, yeah, but if we hadn't done that screening, that green line would be going straight up. Well, that was easy enough to test. This the same database that this employer or uh, privately commercially insured population green line came from, uh, we looked at the publicly insured and uninsured admissions, essentially everybody else for those exact same diagnosis codes over that exact same period and found that the lines were essentially exactly parallel and to the extent they weren't, you were actually better off not having access to a wellness program. So the conclusion is that biometric screening doesn't work, and hence it's done less and less in wellness programs, which have expanded to include other categories that will be more useful and also, I might add, considerably less expensive than uh, screening everybody. So now let's turn to some of the cancer screens, and we'll start with thyroid tumors, because there is this great, oh, great, it wasn't great if you lived in South Korea, but there was a, uh, a very uh, interesting natural experiment that took place in South Korea where around 2000 or so, when this line was popping up a little bit, the South Korean government decided that there was an epidemic of um, thyroid cancer going on. And so to prevent thyroid cancer, they had doctors screening the entire population for thyroid uh, cancer. Um, and the number of cancers quote unquote found uh, skyrocketed over this period. Now, if in fact those really were cancers, you would expect the mortality rate from thyroid cancer to decline because you were finding these cancers early. The problem with thyroid cancer is that it's very difficult to diagnose using just biopsies, needle biopsies of the thyroid. So you get a lot of inconclusive results, which means that patients in South Korea had to get their thyroids removed to see if indeed they had cancer. As it turned out, most of these thyroids, thyroids were removed for naught. And I might add my very own sister-in-law had a very similar experience where her corporate wellness program said she had to go get a thyroid screen and she did and it was inconclusive and she got her thyroid taken out and it turned out she didn't have cancer. But instead of being really miffed at the organization she worked for, she was just thrilled with the wonderful care she got in the hospital from the doctors who took out her thyroid. 
which is one of the reasons there's an awful lot of screening that goes on. Now, it turned out, as you notice from the mortality rate, that most of these thyroids were removed for naught. And as a result, South Korea has now walked back this decision and the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is the government, that's a governing body. It's an advisory body that tells people what screens they ought to do. It's a governing body for Medicare because it tells you what screens they have to cover. Uh, do not recommend screening for thyroid cancer anymore. Now let's look at prostate cancer. So uh, the PSA test and, and quote unquote finding prostate cancer cases was a huge big deal in the early 90s. And in fact, if I had data going back farther, it would show it was even higher. Um, if you had a high PSA test, you would get biopsied. And the thing about getting biopsied for prostate cancer, is don't, it's like thyroid cancer. They don't know exactly where to put the needles. Uh, so they put them in a whole bunch of places. And uh, if 10 needles came up with with the needle biopsies came up with cancer uh, uh, cells, they'd say you had cancer. If one of the 10 said you had uh, cancer, you would be told you had cancer and had to get your thyroid removed or otherwise uh, humongously treated. So there was a ton of cases, quote unquote, found uh, in the early 90s uh, to the extent that um, the person who wrote the book Overdiagnosed, which is my favorite nonfiction book that I myself did not write, I have to say, said uh, all we had to do was look for prostate cancer and we'd find it. So after a while, screening fell out of fashion for prostate cancer. Now, if in fact that screening had been truly finding tumors and tumors that were serious cancer, and we stopped, we, we did half this many screenings, the mortality rate would be going up because we would be missing cancers. But in fact, the mortality rate is essentially independent of the amount of the screening that gets done, which is why right now, prostate cancer screening is generally recommended against. There are exceptions to that, um, you know, first degree relative. And also if you're in a certain age category, you talk about it with your doctor, but it's no longer automatically represented. The person who invented the PSA test screen for prostate cancer says, don't use it. So that by itself is, is an indicator. So now let's look at breast cancer screening. Um, this is a famous slide. You've probably already seen it in uh, health equity presentations uh, because it shows the difference between uh, finding of cancer and mortality in, uh, in the black versus the white uh, female population. Uh, the black incidence is lower, so you would expect a lower mortality rate. But the fact that the mortality rate is higher means both that, that means that essentially the care was not as good. Um, but it also means, because remember, they should have a lower mortality rate, but it also means, and this is why this slide is up here, that they were not getting the preventive care that they should have gotten. If in fact there was a difference in screening rates between black women and white women, um, you could attribute this difference to that screening rate. If the screening rates were the same, you could say that screening did not accomplish anything. But in fact, the screening rate was considerably higher uh, than the population as a whole for white women and considerably lower for, for black women. So it did say that, um, that, there is, that it is prima facie evidence that in fact, breast cancer screening does accomplish something. But you can overscreen people as well. And you take that exact same slide and you put a line, a dotted line in 2009, the significance of that line is that before 2009, the original screening guidelines called for screening every one to two years starting at age 40. After 2009, the screening was every two years starting at age 50. Now the radiologists screamed bloody murder uh, in 2009, when the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force changed it, they said there's going to be an epidemic of breast cancer, there's going to be more deaths, etc. Well, guess what? You literally cannot tell the difference in these lines and these lines between getting screened every two years starting at age 50 or every one to two years starting at age 40, but there are far fewer false positives, far fewer biopsies and unnecessary surgeries so it turned out that in fact, this was too much screening and this is the right amount of screen. Now, <laughs> before you say, well, wait a sec, you know, I have the BRCA uh, gene or I have family history or I have personal history. Remember, this is screening for people who don't have history. 
don't have any reason, any reason other than demographics to be screened. That's what we're talking about here as an employer screening your population. So we've now seen four screens that look like they have dubious effectiveness, or in the case of breast cancer, had effectiveness but uh, was being overscreened. Let's turn to colon cancer. Now, colon cancer seems to be exactly the opposite. The screening started around the time, a little bit, actually the rates were already falling a little bit, but it started around here. And as a result of finding things early, the mortality rates dropped quite a bit. You did not see that in the other, um, well, actually they did in breast cancer because the treatments have gotten better. Treatment's essentially the same as it was in, uh, in prostate cancer. So the mortality rate can be attributed Call to finding, cancer. sorry? In colon cancer. Oh, did I say? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. The mortality rate in colon cancer has fallen quite a bit as more people have, uh, have screening became common. So the question that we want to answer today is not whether to screen, it is how do you screen? And there are, and the, the colonoscopies have been the way to screen in the past, but the question that we're going to answer today is, are colonoscopies the gold standard or are they just the old standard? Now let's review three other screens that are vastly simpler uh, and non-invasive. The Cologuard, the fecal immune, FIT, fecal immuno, immunochemical test, that's easy for me to say, and Garden's got a new Health Shield blood test that um, it's available, but it's not, they haven't heavily marketed it yet. Now, before you say, well, how could these possibly be as good as colonoscopies, because they're so much simpler. Those of you who are dog owners, uh, and if you've had dogs for quite some time, remember in the old days, you had to do a deworming pill every day. And now you do it, depending on the age of the dog, every uh, two to four weeks. And it is actually more effective uh, than the ones you did every day, because it's based on a new technology. And because the technology is so easy, you are much less likely to forget. You know, you're much more likely to comply with a one every 30 day than a one every day. And guess what? These are much easier technologies. But remember, these are not diagnostics. These are screens. And in the case of all three, a positive result then leads to a colonoscopy, which becomes part of the diagnosis. So detection, not diagnosis. And remember, this is not for people who have a, a reason to get screened. This is for the population as a whole. So let's look at these three. Um, actually, we're really not going to look at the garden one in depth, but we'll look at the other two in a little bit of depth. So a uh, Cologuard is mailed to your house, and actually it's mailed to my house. That's the one I used. You collect a, a sample in this container right here, and then you pour in this liquid, and you immediately screw on the lid. The directions don't specify immediately, but trust me when I tell you that immediately cannot come soon enough. And then you go to UPS and send it back. It's that simple and you get your results X number of days later. The FIT is actually available over the counter. Uh, and note that the FIT very clearly says to aid in the detection. It doesn't say anything about diagnosis. It costs almost next to nothing. And like the Cologuard, there's no prep and you get your results right away. Now, as we'll see, it's not as sensitive as the, uh, as the others, but nonetheless, it is absurdly easy and inexpensive. Now, the Garden Shield um, the blood test is too new for this presentation, but I did wanna mention it both because it is out there and I, a lot of people would prefer getting stuck with a needle to what you have to do to you know, do the other tests. I leave that to your uh, decision. The garden folks would say a lot of people do. Color guard folks would probably say most people don't want to get stuck with needles. I'm not getting in the middle of that. But the reason that I mentioned this is because there was a headline, early cancer detection market heats up as Garden Health launches colon cancer test. They meant screen. See how easy it is to mess that up? Now, I believe that Gardent is trying to get uh, approval to call it a test, but for right now, and certainly when this article came out uh, months ago, it was a screen. So the, uh, the, the two things that people look at the most uh, in the screening are sensitivity, which is the percent who test positive, who actually have colon cancer, and the specificity, the percent who test negative, who do not have cancer. 
Um, but we we actually believe, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, including the guy who wrote the book on this, I might add, that the most important statistic is how many deaths did you avert through screening? So this is from uh, up to date, and you can uh, click on it. And I've left out two in the middle because nobody uses them anymore. Uh, this is the three different methodologies that are used now. The colonoscopy every 10 years, the FIT every year, and the uh, FIT DNA, which is actually Cologuard. And it says every year, but I, I think that might be a misprint because um, it's supposed to be every three years. And in each case, they look at the sensitivity and note that the sensitivity on colonoscopies is vastly higher for polyps than it is for these other tests, because what they really should be looking for and what they are looking for is cancers. Um, the sensitivity is the lowest for FIT, but remember you're doing it every year. So the likelihood of something growing between years is much lower. The specificity is actually highest for FIT and don't ask me why I, tried, I looked it up, I couldn't really figure it out. But here is the most important statistic Colorectal can cancer deaths averted per 1,040 year olds. These numbers are essentially identical, okay, for these three different uh, tests. Uh, and this all assumes that if, in fact, you do test positive on one of the simple tests that you followed up with a diagnostic colonoscopy. Uh, so, actually, let's ask the question. And I know we have a couple of questions that have come in. This will give us a chance to answer them. Put up the polling question, do you cover follow-up colonoscopies at 100% for employees who start with Cologuard or FIT? So Mark, if you want to stick that up, and I know we've got questions coming in on the Q&A. Yeah, um, there's one here. Um, uh, why don't you just look at the five-year survival rate on those tests? Ah, the five-year survival rate. The single most overrated statistic, possibly in all of healthcare. Now, um, so... The five-year survival rate is humongously dependent, uh, not so much on the treatment, but on how early you spot uh, the cancer. So to use a hypothetical example, if there is a lethal cancer that will kill you in uh, 10 years, but symptoms don't show up until the sixth year, but they'll show up on a screen on year one, if you screen everybody in year one, you'll get a five-year survival rate of 100% because at the end of five years, everyone is still alive. But if you were, if you screen every, if, if you just look at when the cancer took place in year six, when you have the symptoms, your five-year survival rate is gonna be zero. Same cancer, same treatment, which is to say no treatment at all. Depending on when you start measuring, you get a cancer, a five-year survival rate of 100% or 0%. And therein lies the fallacy of five-year survival. It is vastly more dependent on how early you spot things than it is on the treatment. Mark, how are we doing on this, Paul? All right, yes, don't know um, is, uh, is the winner. Uh, and there's no surprise at all there because, um, I mean, I don't know if my health plan covers it, uh, but it uh, it actually, it just, so number one, you should learn. Number two, if if you don't know, your employees don't know. And we'll get to that part a little bit uh, a little bit later. There were some folks who said that they had to pre-certify it as well. Um, so that was a that was a great polling question. It did turn out the way I frankly expected it to turn out. Uh, just to wrap up on this slide, uh, the the colonoscopy um, technology is not really a technology. It's a process. It's a procedure uh, is really great at finding polyps rather than cancers. And ultimately, what you want to find are cancers in very early uh, very early stages. And you might say, well, you know, polyps are going to turn into cancers. Some portion of them do. The problem is that um, you're only doing this every ten years, so a lot of things can happen in between the screens that are not going to happen when you're screening much more often. Now, one question I, I know it might already be in the Q&A is, well, why do the colonoscopy every 10 years, why did they change the guideline from every five years to every 10 years? Well, the answer is that um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, found evidence of harms with colonoscopy. It was invasive procedure that can result in serious morbidity as well as anxiety, inconvenience, and discomfort for those of you who had them guilty. Uh, and remember, 
Uh, less likely if you're doing it every five years, but aggressive cancers can still appear between screens. Uh, so Al, let's look we, at the... we have a question that came in about the uh, the previous screen about, and the, the question is the, the colo colorectal deaths, are they uh, they're measured in, in what time period? Oh, this is a, a lifetime averted for 40-year-olds. Uh, okay, and there's another question here. If someone had polyps after their initial colonoscopy, would the FIT or Cologuard be something to consider, or would you have to stay the colonoscopy route? Uh, that's that's a great question. I think that's going to depend. Uh, that that's one that uh, you'd have to discuss with your with your doctor. Uh, I mean, I, I myself had a, a couple polyps, and the guy said, "Don't worry about it. You can switch to uh, Cologuard." Um, but if you have you know multiple multiple polyps, and they're I mean they're different sizes and whatnot. Um, the doctor would probably tell you the opposite. These are all good questions coming in. Keep them coming. Uh, now, the complication rates are actually shockingly low. Um, this is 0.06% for total complications. I mean, six per 10,000. But the complications can be quite serious. And perforation is very serious. Uh, and bleeding <laughs> is fairly serious as well, can be very serious. So that's what the USPSTF was uh, was looking at. And as an employer, you, you don't necessarily want to be too aggressive. It's really the only screen you do where the actual act of screening can harm your employees. So as an employer, you don't want to be too aggressive about, uh, you know, trying to encourage people to go out and do that. So final items is let's close with the, or let's close, but let's do, look at this study that showed that colon screening does not prevent death. And you probably read about it. And that was the lead when we talked about doing this actual uh, webinar. Uh, the study just came out a few weeks ago. Uh, it was a, you know, a classic randomized control trial study where you have an invited group and a control group, and they're quite similar demographically, and they were both very large and followed for, I think, 10 years, for very long, yeah, 10 years, for a very long period of time. Uh, the key results were that uh, only 42% of the invited group actually got the colonoscopy, even though it was free. The 10-year absolute risk of colon colorectal cancer was 0.22% lower in the invited group. And the 10-year all-cause death rate was essentially identical in the invited versus the control group. Now, for the purposes of this group, and maybe they weren't looking at cost, the key statistic is the number needed to screen. This is how many employees do you need to screen with a colonoscopy to prevent one case of colorectal cancer? And the answer is 455 people, which means it would cost you about a million dollars for every cancer you find. And remember, there's no guarantee if you find it that you're gonna um, cure it. Now, Al, we uh, have a, another question here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, that uh, 455, uh, number needed to screen. That seems like a high number. How does that compare to other screens? Uh, it's actually considerably lower than other screens. Uh, if you were to read the book over diagnosed, you'd find that for breast cancer is about one in a thousand. Uh, and that is the second best. I mean, the others uh, are uh, considerably higher than that. I mean, for uh, for heart attack, uh, the, the in fact, I think there's a well, I'm not going to look for it, but uh, I did an article on that. And it turns out it's about, you have to screen about 10,000 people uh, to prevent one heart attack. So this is actually a shockingly low number right here. Was there another question, Mark? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Um, now that's a low number. It's a good segue. Uh, but colon cancer is largely a disease of uh, older folks, retirees for the most part. But within the last uh, few years, the American Cancer Society, and for that matter, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force have recommended screening 45 to 49-year-olds who have much, much lower uh, likelihood of just finding a random tumor. If you work out the math, and I'm not going to, in 45 minutes, I'm not going to work out the math here for you, but you can write to me and I'll tell you, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the general calculation is that the number needed to screen in the 45 to 49-year-old cohort using colonoscopy or is closer to 5,000 to 10,000, uh, which means that if you're using colonoscopies, it's going to cost you 10 to $20 million to detect one cancer early. So um, looking at, the, uh, at that study, 
um, the uh, control versus the full invited group. Uh, I want to add now the participants as a standalone group, the participants as a proportion of the fully invited group, because the critics of that study said, no, you have to measure the participants. That will tell you the uh, efficacy of the drug or of, of the intervention. There's a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. Efficacy is how well something works in theory and effectiveness is how well it works in the population as a whole. So there's no question of the efficacy of colon cancer screening using colonoscopies. The gray represents the participants. The incidence was much lower and the death rate was much lower. Um, the all-cause death rate didn't hardly budge because even though colon cancer is the number one uh, cancer uh, killer in the US of non-smokers, not a lot of people die of cancer except for smokers under the age of 65, or if they do, they're dying of, of you know fairly rare uh, cancer. So that's why your all-cause death rate uh, hardly budges here. Um, were you to, to look at something like, let's say there was a, a heart attack preventive technique that was equally effective as this, well, this number would be falling by quite a bit because dying of a heart attack is vastly more likely under the age of 65 than dying of uh, colon cancer. But the key, key statistic is the difference between effectiveness and efficacy is that only 42% of this population are willing to get colonoscopies. The best screen in the world is no good if people aren't willing to be screened by it. So that brings us to Quizify's recommendations, which are, um, there are three very good, very easy tests out there that people may either may, they might not be familiar with, or they might assume like, like, the, uh, like we talked about earlier, that they can't possibly be as effective as a colonoscopy because they're so easy. So we can educate on the value of these things. You should, and you can use Quizify to help. We would gently discourage first line screening colonoscopies for employees with no particular risk factors. Screen, not test, using Quizify. And I say gently because if we try too hard, the employees say, oh, they're just trying to save money because a colonoscopy costs so much money. Um, and uh, we would recommend covering follow-up colonoscopies at 100% to encourage screening and using these easy tests instead. Uh, and these are, will all be covered at 100%. We would also frankly say cover all colonoscopies at 100%, both because it's easy for employees to remember and also because, well, if you were to cover, say, physical therapy or telehealth at 100%, you'd get dramatic amounts of overuse. No one is going to overuse colonoscopies because they don't have to pay for them. Um, and you do not want to discourage employees from, uh, from getting them. So... Um, we, we asked you before if you knew your policy. I think if you don't, the, the don't know is one. So I, I suspect I know the uh, answer to this one, but the polling question is, and you can put up any time, uh, do your employees know your coverage policy for follow-up colonoscopy if they first get Cologuard or FET? And I'm looking at the screen, I'm seeing a couple more QAs. Yeah, so we do have a question here, Al. Uh, my plan covers screening colonoscopy 100%, including removal of polyps found. But I think if an FIT test, for example, was positive, then the follow-up colonoscopy might be considered a test subject to my $8,000 deductible, which means I'd have to pay for it. How do I factor that into the, that financial impact into my choice of screening method? Okay, that, that's a great question, and it's got several answers. Uh, one is that if you, this sounds like an actual, you know, we have some actual people on here who are not running employee benefit plans. You might want to check with your insurance because as of 2022, mid-2022, the guidance from the ACA, uh, I'm sorry, from the Department of Labor and uh, said that, um, that these follow-up uh, to positive tests do have to be covered as preventive. So I don't, don't absolutely take my word for it, but that's the new uh, policy. Now, that's not apply to employer-sponsored plans. It's only for actual insurance type insurance, not ERISA plans. So do, do check that. Um, and uh, let's see how the poll did. All right, yes, I am pretty darn sure that, uh, that nobody does, which of course is why Quizify, uh, why Quizify exists because uh, either they only a few people do 
or nobody has any idea. And, and if you put that down, you know, don't feel like you've fallen down on the job. This is, believe me, I didn't know I had to check with my own just recently, just today, actually, with my wife's plan to see if it was covered by them. So, and remember, I'm the guy doing the webinar. So you're, you're totally, you know, don't worry about it, basically. So uh, we would like to go, um, no pun intended, in depth on the uh, colon screening uh, for your employees because there's a lot they need to know about it. Why do you need to do it? Well, it's the number one killer. Uh, how often and what's the best screen for someone's particular circumstances? And then why are most positives false? Okay, now, frankly, we could do a half hour webinar on this topic alone, but if you're looking, let's use the... Uh, the 45 to 49 year old example, where you're gonna find about one uh, cancer in 10,000 people. And you saw what the sensitivities were. Let's say you have a test that's 90% sensitive, um, which means it's 10% uh, our people are gonna get uh, positive results. Uh, I mean, assume that only one in the 10,000 has cancer, you're testing 10,000 people uh, 9,000 are going to come back negative, but if the test is only 90%, uh, 1,000 are going to come back positive. So even the positives are only one in 1,000 is going to have um, colon cancer. Now, of course, everyone who gets a positive thinks it's going to be them, but nonetheless, we would educate employees on um, you know positives, uh, false positives. Now, I will tell you, we will not put that in the first quiz. That's something we typically don't do for about three years after we start um, we start Quizify. And then, of course, you got to let them know, as we've covered in this webinar multiple ways, whether the follow-up colonoscopies are covered at 100%. Now, I'm going to guess that, they, that you do cover them at 100%, uh, because unless you've specified otherwise, typically your carrier is going to be following the guidance from um, you know the uh, what they call the the, the tri the three the the, the uh, HHS and labor and I can't remember the third but there there are three de departments that get together on these things and your insurer your carrier is likely to be following your guidance so unless you specify otherwise it is quite possible you already are following uh, follow uh, doing follow up colonoscopies at 100 percent and in fact Medicare itself as of um, uh, one and a half months from now, January 1, is also doing follow-up colonoscopies 100%. I mean, basically, over time, I think the what we're saying here, the easy tests are going to just become the first-line tests. I mean, colonoscopies are a, are a very, uh, you know, swatting a, a, a fly with a cannonball uh, type technology for, uh, for screening. And all you're going to be doing after this webinar is getting way ahead of the curve on, on, um, on that particular insight. Now, we've got your back on these questions. Quizify has your back on these questions. Um, this is an example right off the um, right off of Quizify for people with no known risk factors. The most important and effective cancer screen is on your colon. And then we've got learn more links about these screens. Which colon cancer screen is clearly most likely to save your life? We've got the three. And then the car cancer is apparently take your pick. And most, this is what I mean by gently discouraging colonoscopies. Okay. No one who looks at this and follows the learn more link is going to pick a colonoscopy as their first line. Or if they do, it's because they've got a first degree relative or they have some history. And frankly, they probably should be picking it as the first line. And Mark talked earlier about our doctor visit prep kits where um, what we call mastering the clinical visit um, by knowing what to prepare and what questions to ask for 168 different uh, categories. One of those categories is colon screening, where we do have a list of questions to ask the doctor to make sure that you are the right screens and the right people are getting together. So uh, final polling question. Based on what we've explored in this brief webinar, Will you continue to cover only the initial screen at 100% as currently uh, required uh, for ERISA plans, cover the initial screen and follow-up colonoscopies at 100%, cover the initial and the follow-up, and then use Quizify to educate employees on the importance of screening, 
or some combination of C and D, some combination of C and D. Um, and do we have any? Yeah, final? we have another question that came in about the, the uh, these newer blood tests. Mm -hmm. What about blood tests like gallery, which is supposed to indicate the presence of cancer? Uh, if it's not approved by CLIA, which is, oh God, remember what it stands for, something about lab tests. It's like the FDA equivalent of lab tests. Uh, I would not be doing it. And I can tell you right now that the only CLIA approved test for colon cancer blood test is in fact the Gardent Shield. So this is not to say that someday another test won't get that approval, but if you're messing with your colon, and remember we know that colon cancer is number one, I would be using a, um, a CLIA approved test. Screen, screen. All right, what do we have here? All right, so the winners in combination actually, because C and D frankly both involve Quizify are, uh, yes, uh, we will educate for you. And uh, yes, you should probably use some kind of uh, some kind of incentive. Um, but essentially, nobody is uh, is going to be covering just the uh, that's just the initial initial screen uh, going forward. So um, unless we have any other questions, I believe I you know I, I put in that extra fifteen minutes because I knew we had more than half an hour of material. Do we have anything extra out there? Uh, well, there's one other question. Does the ACA require coverage for the non-colonoscopy screens that are done more frequently? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, in, in Remember, the ACA, which is administered by this, uh, these, these three cabinet departments uh, combined, only uh, applies to um, plans that are not Employer-sponsored non-ERISA plans, but non but ERISA plans tend to follow what the non-ERISA plans do. Okay, um, and now and thank you, everyone. We are going to be following up with uh, the recording and the slides for everybody. Um, there is another question here, Al. Okay, um, that's a it's a what about skin cancer detection? That's not oh specific, okay. Well, yes, we did not mention skin cancer detection. Uh, for a very good reason, and and those of you who are still on the uh, on the webinar, uh, one would think that this would be an obvious and easy screen to do, and would have the full support of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. I mean, you look at, you know, sometimes I mean, I've been in line at like Disney World or something, and you look at someone in front of you, and they've got this big mole on their back, and you really want to say something, you know. Uh, so it seems like uh, that would be like a three alarm fire, you know, having a mole changing shape, and it should be something that's easily, uh, you know, that, that the USPSTF should be totally behind. And yet, having researched it, I would say that their quote unquote inconclusive um, uh, finding is in fact, you know, supportable. I, I myself get screened every year, and I personally would recommend it. But uh, it is not required under the ACA, and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force does not recommend for or against it. All righty. Well, uh, we did it just on time, and most people stayed with it. And I, I think from the questions, a lot of people were very engaged, and uh, you will be getting a call from us. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.